38. I will praise thee with my whole heart. Before the gods will I sing praise unto thee. I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. In the day when I cried, thou answeredst me and strengthenest me with strength in my soul. All the kings of the earth shall praise thee, O Lord, when they hear the words of thy mouth. Yea, they shall sing in the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. Though the Lord be high, yet hath he respect unto the lowly, but the proud he knoweth afar off. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, thou wilt revive me, Thou shalt stretch forth thine hand against the wrath of mine enemies, and thy right hand shall save me. The Lord will perfect that which concerneth me. Thy mercy, O Lord, endureth forever. Forsake not the works of thine own hands. Thank you, Father, for this day, for your word, Lord. I thank you for the Psalms. I thank you, God, that we can see them and hear them and read them and behold them and even have one in our own hands, Lord, because you've given us uh, such blessings in the country that we live, where we're born right now. I pray, God, that you would uh, just continue to uh, keep it so that we can make, live quiet and peaceable lives and, and have your words with us at all times. Um, I just pray, God, that you would open up our understanding today. Lord, work in all of us to receive of your good word and receive of the truths that you want us to behold today from your scriptures. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. So what I want to talk about here is our God is before the gods. Our God is before the gods, is in, is in front of, is, is, is preeminent to the gods. Psalm 138, um, and this kind of ties in a little bit with the reading that I've had uh, as I've been going through the book of Daniel recently, and that you have this God complex that comes across people when they get great power. But God is before all these gods. So they would set themselves up as a god or as as one of many gods the reality is is that though you may have the utmost of power in this world god is before you god is preeminent to you and god deserves the preeminence nebuchadnezzar showed time and time again that he thought of himself as some great thing as some great god upon earth as someone that should be worshipped but the reality is no god is before these gods First one says, I will praise thee with my whole heart. Before the gods will I sing praise unto thee. And it, it, this is David essentially proclaiming that he is going to praise the Lord wholeheartedly with his entirety of his heart. And the Lord is worthy of that entire heart, wholehearted praise unto him Amen. as David provides it. Before the gods will I sing praise unto thee. It reminds me again of Daniel who was told that he was not to pray to anyone but Nebuchadnezzar, but he decided that before the God, though they set themselves up, he was going to keep doing what he's always done. He was going to open his window. And before the gods, if he has an affront to the gods, he was going to pray unto the God that is worthy of that wholehearted praise unto him. Uh, that wholeness of praise is entirety, it's, it's completion, it's perfectness, it's a fullness of the heart given unto the praise of God. And it's done publicly, and it's done before all. David here, he says, I will sing praise unto God. I will sing praise unto thee before the gods. Before the gods, Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar realized that there was... There was a difference between um, all the other gods of the earth and the God of Daniel. If you look at Daniel chapter 2, keep your place there in Psalm 138. Daniel chapter 2, if you would, in verse 46, it says, Then the king Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face and worshipped Daniel and commanded that they should offer an oblation and sweet orders unto him. The king answered unto Daniel and said, Of a truth it is that your God is a God of gods, and a Lord of kings, and a revealer of secrets, seeing thou couldest reveal this secret. We all know the story that Daniel made the interpretation that the wise men, the soothsayers, and the astrologers, and the, all the men in the courts of Nebuchadnezzar could not make. The catch being that he also, he didn't just want them to give the interpretation, he wanted to even know the dream because he had even forgotten that himself. And Daniel 
Daniel, through the power of God, was given revelation of that, and when he portrayed it, obviously Nebuchadnezzar is very confused here because he worships Daniel and then just lumps God in with the gods and with the kings as just another god in his court. But he recognized that he is the capital G, God of gods. He is the Lord of kings. In other words, he has the preeminence. He is before the gods. He is in front of. He is preeminent to these gods. And we realize this day, as, as Nebuchadnezzar had done, because of the great works that God does. We recognize that God has power over this world. We recognize that God ruleth the children of man. When we see something like, like a, a healing happen because we had sought the Lord in prayer, God answered the prayer, and what a miraculous thing. Within a, within a week's time, we saw the work of God come to fruition. We saw revelation of him um, because he had done that great work. And this was the same thing that Nebuchadnezzar experienced. He saw the great work that God did in Daniel's life to answer that question, to answer that, that dream, that interpretation that no one else could. And he saw the great works and says, your God, Daniel, is a God of the gods. He is a Lord of the kings. He is greater than them. Yes, we do realize that in our lives, when we see great works happen, we give glory to God and we recognize it that way. But not only his great works, I believe we realize it first and foremost because of his great book. Because God has explained, God has given instruction, God has given wisdom, God has given the King James Bible whereby we can know him and understand him and comprehend him and see many more works. The Bible says we have here a more sure word of prophecy. I think a lot of us would say, yeah, I'll get on board and believe God wholeheartedly. I will give him praise wholeheartedly if I was to see the transfiguration, for example. If I was to see Christ transfigured before me and I was to see him bodily in all his glory and a great voice come from heaven that says that says this are thou art my son in whom I am well pleased this is my son here he am I think then a lot of us would say yeah absolutely we'll give glory and praise and wholeheartedly praise the Lord of heaven but the reality is as Peter pointed out we have a more sure word of prophecy we can behold even greater things of our God through the pages of the scriptures. And that's what David continues to work in that vein. He continues to talk about this. He says, I will praise thee with my whole heart. Before the gods will I sing praise unto thee. Before the world in the temporal state I will sing praise unto thee. We realize that we can be on the same page, I believe, because of the great book that he has written. Look there in verse 2. Psalm 138, verse 2. I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name. For thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. The Bible says that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Furnished unto do all great works that you would have. And I believe that this is, and my pastor says it all the time, he says, this is the greatest 316 in the Bible. If you look at the 316s throughout the Bible, there's all sorts of really great and interesting truths contained within them that, that speak to a greater truth about, about that, that number combination, 316, and kind of, you know, what, what it would mean. Why is that special? But as he points out, as my pastor points out often, even John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. As that is a truly great John 3.16, what is it without 2 Timothy 3.16, which says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable? What is John 3.16 if we don't have the understanding that that very scripture contained within John in chapter 3 and verse 16 is given by inspiration of God? If we don't know that it's the very words of God, if we don't know that it's profitable for correcting us, instructing us, giving us doctrine, thoroughly furnishing us unto all good works, if we don't understand that, then we've got nothing. We've, we've got just a word. So so. What is it about that 316 that really hides it? It's the same thing that we see here in Psalm 138. It says, Thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. God's word is, is the utmost. God's word is the most important thing. He offers unto us, for without it, we know nothing of God. Above thy name, the Bible says, and that includes Jesus, that includes Lord, but that also includes the reputation of him as such. 
God, yes, that is his name. Jesus, the Father, the Lord. We know this. But uh, the idea of name has two different connotations. It's, it's your name that we title you. It's also your name as in reputation. Someone will say of somebody, oh, he has a good name. His family has a good name. They have a good reputation. People hear that name and they think good things. They think right thoughts. They know that that man has a good name. And God has both great names for his one name given under heaven whereby we must be saved. And that's the name of the Lord Jesus. But he also has a great reputation. He has, he has a fantastic reputation. His name is true. His name is pure. Jesus, Lord, Father. Almighty God, Savior, I am. Yes, those are great names. Those are great titles of our Lord. But what about these that apply more to the reputation of Him? What about Alpha and Omega? What about Advocate, Author and Finisher, Bread of Life, Beloved Son of God? What about our Deliverer? What about our Chief Cornerstone? What about the uh, Good Shepherd? What about our Head? What about our Judge? What about King of Kings, Lamb of God, Light of the World, Mediator? Messiah, Mighty One, Prince of Peace, Redeemer, Rock, the Door, the Way, the Word, the True Vine, the Truth. What about Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. These are all great names of God. They're also great names that signify His reputation. Amen. God has a good name. God has a great name. God has the name above all names whereby we must be saved. He also has the greatest reputation of every God. He is before the gods. Some people might look at some rich mogul and say, man, that guy's got a great name. Some people might look at some person that does all sorts of uh, charitable work. That guy's got a good name. Nothing compares to the name of our Savior. Amen. Nothing compares to the name of our Lord. It's the name above every name. It's the Amen. only name given whereby we must be saved. But his name is subservient. His name is below. His name has the Word of God magnified over top of it. So any name, any reputation, any, any caricature, any personality, any trait, any, anything that you would know or behold or understand about God, we only have because of the Word of God. And this is why he has magnified his Word above all that name. Because we wouldn't know all these titles. Alpha and Omega from Revelation. We would know that if we didn't have Revelation, the Comforter. We wouldn't know that if we didn't have John 14 through 16. We just wouldn't have that. We just wouldn't know that. God magnified His Word above all His name. That is the preeminence. It's the Word of God. And, and, and that is paramount. Show that to the Jehovah's Witness next time you talk to them. Because they want to talk about Jehovah and how it's the most important thing in the whole Bible or, or, or whatever they want to do. He has magnified His Word above all thy name. And if you're in disobedience to his word, it doesn't matter if you're, if you're one of these guys that is, is trying to pronounce, you know, Jehoshua, Jehoshua, Jehoshua. Je you're going to pronounce his name in a particular way. You're going to make that the most important thing in your world, in your religious mind, is how you pronounce the name of God. He has magnified his word above all his names. Amen. He has all these names. You can call him judge. You can call him Lamb of God. Come to my aid. Alpha and Omega. You can call the Lord by any one of these names and he'll give an ear. He will lend an ear unto you and he will answer you. You can praise him by each and every one of these names. Bread of life, I love you. I give you all the praise and all the glory for the answered prayers. But hey, if you don't have his word, you've got nothing. He has magnified his word above all his names. His, his word encompasses all his names. His word reveals all his names. Our God is before the gods in this, in this manner. His name is revealed to us in his word. His name is important in as much as his word gives credence to it, gives, gives support to it, encourages it, lifts it up, magnifies the names. Going through the scriptures. Before the gods, look in verse 2 again. The Bible says, I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. And I love this. I will worship towards thy holy temple. And this is another thing that puts God above in preeminence towards the other gods that we make up. Is that you can worship towards his holy temple. But it's not in the same way that the world does. It's not in the same way that the false religions do. Look at the, the Muslims, they get these little carpets and they point them in a certain direction and then they aim their foreheads at, at, at a game cube that came from outer space and they stick their butts up in the air and that's how they worship their God. They, they worship towards that holy temple. 
right? The Jews, they have a Roman fortress wall that they go and they, they shake in front of and they pray unto the wall. And, and that's the holy temple that they're going to point themselves to. But God here, he says, he says, I will worship towards thy holy temple. This is David saying, I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness. Now, if you were to hold your place there in Psalm chapter 138 and turn with me uh, to 1 Kings chapter 8, you do see that there was a time, 1 Kings chapter 8, there was a time when men would pray toward a physical temple. But it wasn't as we see in the Muslim religion, where they have an item they're facing. It wasn't as the Jews who have an item that they're facing. It wasn't as lame Christians do today, where they're all pointing themselves at a giant screen in a rock band and screaming and praying toward that holy temple. There's many sacred cows in religions. There's many things where people will point their focus of idolatry upon as they pray to the temple of their God. But even as Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 3 made up an image of himself and made everyone to bow down to it, made everyone to worship that image that represented Nebuchadnezzar and who he was, it's nothing but an idol. It's nothing but a sacred cow. It's nothing but a lowercase g God. And before that is our God. Amen. In the Old Testament, 1 Kings chapter 8. 1 Kings chapter 8. And look in verse 29. Thine eyes, that thine eyes may be open toward this house, night and day, even toward the place of which thou hast said, My name shall be there, that thou mayest hearken unto the prayer which thy servant shall make toward this place. And hearken thou to the supplication of thy servant and of thy people Israel, when they shall pray toward this place. And hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place, when thou hearest, Forgive. So we see in the Old Testament time, too, there was a direction given. They were to pray toward the place. This is at the dedication. This is after, Sam's, or, uh, after Solomon had, had unveiled the temple in its completion. And he says, hey, Lord, when people pray toward this place, when people, when people lean their supplications directionally at this place, Lord, would you hear? Lord, would you, would you answer them? Lord, would you find their supplications and give of their need. But it wasn't just the building that was important in this case. Look at 2 Chronicles chapter 7. 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles. In chapter 7, the Bible shows us why people were praying in the direction of the temple. 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 12, the Bible says, And the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer, and have chosen this place to myself for an house of sacrifice. If I shut up heaven, that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. He refers to this quite often as his house. He refers to it as the place that he has chosen for a house, for a place where he would inhabit. And yes, the Bible does say he inhabits both heaven and both this place on earth. And this is why people would pray toward that temple, would pray into the direction of that temple, would come to that temple to pray. But does it shock us that the God that is omnipresent is in both heaven and upon earth, is, is being able to sought in is sought in heaven as well as upon earth. It shouldn't shock us. It shouldn't alarm us. God is everywhere and in everything. He has chosen that place for that time in order that people could worship toward his holy temple. But look at now. Go to John in the New Testament. John chapter 2. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Things are different now since Christ walked upon earth. Things are different now Look at John chapter 2 and verse 18. The Bible says, John 2 and verse 18. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years with this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple 
of his body. When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. So we can worship now toward his holy temple. What is his holy temple now? Well, Jesus fairly clearly said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. But he spake of the temple of his body. We can pray directly toward the temple as it reveals in the Old Testament. David pointing himself at the temple of God, the brick and mortar temple that he saw before him. But now it's been revealed in the New Testament that the temple is none other than the body of Jesus Christ. This is the same body that if you look in John chapter 20, if you look in John chapter 20, the same body in John chapter 20 that Mary was not allowed to touch. Look at verse 17, John 20, verse 17. Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. He said, Touch me not. This is almost the picture of like the Old Testament, the, the separation that was there where, where Mary could not behold, she could not directly seek, she could not embrace her Lord at that time. He said, touch me not, I have not been raised from the dead. But this is the same temple, the temple of his body, that now a few verses later in verse 26, it says, after eight days again, his disciples were within and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus the doors being shut and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger and behold my hands. Reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side. Be not faithless, but believing. Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Now Thomas was giving free course. He was able to behold Jesus in the flesh, in the resurrected, glorified body that he was in. He was also able to touch to behold, to embrace, to feel the prince. All those things that were giving him doubt at the time. He was able to, now face to face, pray unto. Now face to face, seek after. Glory to God, the temple was raised up. And we know that prophetically, that temple came to naught and was, is now rubble. There's nothing left of it. Bits and pieces of it drug all over Jerusalem to build various other monuments, the other lowercase g gods. But hey, those gods are nothing. Christ is before them. He is above them. He is preeminent to them. Why? Because the temple that is important to him is the temple of his body. And that temple died, was buried, rose again three days later triumphantly. That temple is now glorified. And now we as Christians can worship toward thy holy temple, as it says in John chapter 38. But in a much different way, or in Psalm chapter 138, in a much different way, we can worship toward thy holy temple. That's what makes our God better than all the other gods. They're stuck in buildings. They're stuck in, in, in monuments. They're stuck in idols. They're stuck worshiping worshiping rock, stone, art graven by man's device, whereas we can worship toward the temple of the resurrected Christ. The Bible says, which Amen. temple are ye? Because we are in Christ. Glory to God. That's amazing. The temple was raised up. Worship must be directed at it. The temple of his body. The temple of Christ himself. If we worship Christ, we have access to the Father, for he brings that intercession directly to him. See John... Or, uh, Psalm, sorry, 139. This is another interesting truth. Yeah, we can say, okay, we can point our prayers. But that almost gives it a direction, even though I said also that God is everywhere. But here's something that would reinforce that truth. If you were to look from Psalm 138 over to Psalm 139, in verse 7, the Bible says, Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven... Thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me and thy right hand shall hold me. You're not getting away from God. And that's the other thing that's great about him is that while the temple is his body, his body is everywhere. You can pray to God standing, sitting, kneeling, running, jumping, skipping, sleeping. You can pray to God anywhere, anytime, in any fashion, and God will hear the soul that is 
reaching out to him with a full heart. The soul that is reaching out to him in songs of praises. Seeking supplication from him. God is always there and his right hand is able to strengthen you. His right hand is able to guide you. His right hand is able to lead you, to hold you, to keep you, to strengthen you anywhere. With Jesus, I would gladly go. And anywhere with Jesus, you can safely go because that's where God is. God is everywhere. Christ is everywhere. Christ in you, the hope of glory. The Holy Spirit walks with you. You have access to God. You have access to the heavenlies all the time. That's why our God is before the gods. That's why our God is greater than any would lift themselves up as gods. It's clear. Our God is before the gods. What other way? Verse 3. Look at verse 3. In the day when I cried... Thou answered me and strengthenest me with strength in my soul. In the day, look in Daniel chapter 10. <clears throat> Keep your finger there. If you would, just a few books over, Daniel chapter 10. Anywhere you can reach God. Anywhere you can get a hold of God. I can't get a hold of Daniel, though. Daniel chapter 10. Daniel chapter 10. In Daniel chapter 10, you find this coming to realization here. It says, in those days, look at it, in the day answered God. That's what we're writing in Psalm 138. Here it says, in those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth, neither did I anoint myself at all, till three whole weeks was fulfilled. Right before that, it says that in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a thing was revealed unto Daniel, whose name was called Belteshazzar, and the thing was true, but the time appointed was long, and he understood the thing, and he had understanding of the vision. But then we find here Daniel seeking after God by prayer and supplication through this, fasting for three whole weeks till, be, till these things be fulfilled, till these three whole weeks are fulfilled. Daniel is seeking after God. Well, why? Why is this great mourning happening? Why? Because he's looking for revelation. He's looking for understanding. He's looking for biblical truth. And if you look down in verse 10, the Bible is clear. And behold, an hand touched me. So after Daniel was praying, after Daniel was waiting, a hand reaches out and touches him, which set me upon my knees and upon the palms of my hands. Such great weight came upon him. Spiritual power came upon him to the point where he fell. And he said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto thee, and stand upright. For unto thee am I now sent. And when he had spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling. Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand, and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come. For thy words, and it continues on to give him the prophecy. From that first day, just like it said in Psalm 138, in the day when I cry, thou answerest me. In that exact same day, that exact same hour, when you call out to God, he is there waiting to answer that prayer. We know that the story of Daniel continues, that he describes, the angel describes that though the prayer was answered instantaneously, there was this great battle in heaven, there was this great war where there was another angel pressing against him, fighting against him, keeping the angel back from answering that prayer unto Daniel. But God heard, as it said in Psalm 138, in that day that he cried unto him, in that day that he started to afflict himself, started to seek after the Lord thy God. God answered. And it says this, he had that same day answer, and even though there was a later delivery, there was strength sent to his soul. Through that morning, I believe, through that prayer, through that fasting, though at times it doesn't seem right, that's where strength is. And this is our problem, is that we will ask the Lord for something, and then we'll just kind of give up. We'll just kind of walk away. But the strength that we get in waiting for our prayers to be answered comes from the time of, of spiritual seeking after God. It comes from the time of looking after those things, praying after those things, asking repeatedly. Um, and I believe that when we actually engage ourselves in that spiritual battle by praying unto God through those trials and through those tribulations, though it took many weeks for that prayer to come to realization in the natural realm, though it took a while, God answered that prayer instantaneously. And perhaps by Daniel getting involved in the spiritual battle, he aided and, and helped the angel to bring it to him in a more timely fashion. And through that, I believe that's where the strength comes. The strength to my soul. The Bible says, strengthen it's me 
with strength in my soul. So the strength and that power comes to your innermost. It comes to your being. It comes to your core. And it comes through, I believe, that affliction that you have when you're seeking God in prayer. God answers you in that same day. And he's better than all the other gods because all the other gods, they don't answer you at all. They have mouths, but they speak not. Ears have they, but they hear not. Eyes have they, but they see not. They're dumb, foolish idols. And the Bible says, they that make them are like unto them. People that grave idols and set them up and worship them are as dumb, blind, ignorant, stupid, worthless as the idols that they made. That's what happens to people. They that make them are like unto them. They might as well both just be stupid, dumb, blind statues standing there because there is no difference. You, you give yourselves over to that junk and you're, and you're stuck in that. But God answers prayer. And he does it instantaneously. And even though we may not see it come to fruition instantaneously, hey, God promises that that's what happens. I believe that. The Bible here says, In the day when I cried, thou answerest me. Now, our problem otherwise is also that we think that an answer must always be affirmative. God must, God must just answer my prayer at every whim. I need more money. I need a new car. I need this. And we don't see it come to fruition, and we're just like, God's not answering my prayers. He is answering, but his answer is no. And he answered that right away. It may not have come to your life in, in due time because you're just still waiting and wondering and hoping and thinking. But the reality is, is that that's an answer all of itself. Why does God do that? Well, because... He is strengthening your soul through it. He is giving you power through it. Even though you're waiting for an instant answer to prayer, the waiting is actually what grows you in patience. It's actually what gives you hope. It grows your experience. It strengthens you as a Christian. It strengthens you as a believer. And it teaches you that maybe some of the things that you're praying about aren't that needful. Maybe when you find out a few days later, you're like, well, you know, I didn't really need that. That was kind of a silly prayer to pray. That's a great big revelation that we all need to come to. Be content with such things as we have and not always seeking God for those things that he already has understanding of. He already knows that we have need of a house. He already has, he knows that we have need of food on our table. He knows that we have need of a wife. He knows that we have need of a saved father. He knows that we have need of those things. We need to pray, ask him, trust him, and leave it there. He answered you right away. He answered you right away. It may not be in front of you. It may not be before you. You may not have it right now, but God answered you. And I believe in things like that, things that are according to his will. Like, it's not good that a man be alone. It's not, it's, uh, you know, he, he desires that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Those are according to his will. He will answer those things in, in the affirmative. Our job is to just, just pray for it, continue to pray for it, hope in it, trust in it. Say, God, I know it's answered. I know that you are going to do this. It, it may not be in my timing. It may not be something that I even see or experience right now in the timing that I need it to be. But, God, I'm trusting you to give it to me or to give me something better. Because that's how God works. He, he wants what's best for his children. But I believe in specific prayers, God answers them, as it says, right away. In the day that you pray, he answers those prayers. And sends strength to your soul as you wait for them. In verse 4, our God is before the gods. He's also before all the kings. Look at verse 4. All the kings of the earth. Psalm 138, verse 4. All the kings of the earth shall praise thee, O Lord, when they hear the words of thy mouth. Nebuchadnezzar did the same thing. Yeah, he did worship Daniel, and he called the Lord your God, referring to Daniel. He said, it's your God. We see in chapter 3, he sets himself up as God, and then he makes this great decree, and then when he throws the men into the fiery, burning fiery furnace, as he promised to do if they didn't fall down and worship him, when he does that and they survive and they come out, he again has this great revelation that God is the God of gods, and, and he cries that out again, and he makes a great decree. But look in the Daniel chapter 4 and verse 33. In Daniel 4 verse 33, the same hour was the thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar, and he was driven from men and did eat grass as oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till his hairs were grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. And at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lift up my eyes unto heaven, and mine understanding returned unto me, and I blessed the Most High, and praised and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation, and all inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing, and he doth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say to him, What doest thou? 
At the same time, my reason returned unto me, and for the glory of my kingdom, mine honor and brightness returned unto me. My counselors and my lords sought unto me. I was established in my kingdom, and excellent majesty was added unto me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, all whose works are truth, and his ways judgment, and those that walk in pride he is able to obey. He finally got it. Glory to God. He finally got it after all these things that he's been through. He understood that. He sets himself up as a God. He's proud, and now he's abased, and he's, he's the lowest of the low. He loses everything. And glory to God, Nebuchadnezzar got it back and so much more. And on top of that, he's a child of the king. He's, he's, he's extolling the king of heaven. He's loving his God. He's reaching out to his God and just giving praise unto his God. And all the kings will do that one day. All the kings, the Bible says in Psalm chapter 138, shall praise thee, O Lord, when they hear the words of thy mouth. Sadly, sadly, most of them will not have the same grace bestowed upon them as Nebuchadnezzar did. Sadly, most of them will have their hearts so hardened as Pharaoh who they will never actually taste of the love of the grace of the mercy of the salvation of the living God before they depart from this world. But regardless, they shall give praise to the Lord God of heaven, whether they're crying from hell or rejoicing in heaven. And that's the sad example. That's the sad truth is that most of them are so lift up, are so puffed up, are so prideful, are all so full of themselves that they would actually think that them as lowercase g gods are somehow bigger than the God of heaven. So they'll ignore him. They'll despite him. They'll put him aside. And God put off will just give them over to the hardness of their mind. Give them over to that reprobate mind. And that will be the end of them. But in the end, regardless, though kings set themselves as though they would have preeminence, though rulers set themselves up as though they should be kings, God will have the preeminence. And our God is before all of these lowercase g gods who would set themselves up. Look what, look what he realized. He realized that God's works are truth. He realized that God's ways are judgment. He realized that, that there is no other God other than the God, the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings. And he reached out to him and said, God, I'm humbled. God, I've been humiliated. God, there's nothing in me that's going to overcome this kind of scenario, go overcome this situation. I need to be saved. And he called upon the name of the Lord there. They shall sing, verse 5 says, Yea, they shall sing in the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. This ought to be a great warning to all the kings of the earth, those that would set themselves up. The story of Nebuchadnezzar, he was at the height. He, he ruled over the entirety of the world. He made a great image to himself and had, had all of the world come and worship that. And it's a warning to all those who would set themselves up, even in a minuscule way, to do the same, that, hey, one day you're going to call out to the Lord. One day you're going to sing praises to the Lord. One day you're going to hear of his word and receive of his truth. And I pray to God that it would be on this side of glory and not in hell beneath. Before the gods, the Lord be high. Look at verse 6. Though the Lord be high, yet hath he respect unto the lowly, but the proud he knoweth far off. And I love this. The Lord is high, but he has respect unto the lowly. Look at the God of Islam. He puts himself as up if he is high, but he has respect unto nobody. The Bible, or, or their version of a, of a false scripture, of, of, a, of a lying, divining sign or wonder, whatever they have, whatever they want to call it, their scriptures record their God has no regard to anybody. Their God is nothing but this, this proud, this arrogant, this whosoever will according to my will he puts one up lifts one down with no discernment no regard they say that he has an equal balance they say that he'll match your good works to your evil but he can take according to his own will even one that would have more good works and just say ah never mind and just cast him into hell do you know why he's able to do that because he's never recorded as having love for anything in reality is if you have no love for anyone anything anything other than what is your love for it's for self and that's what that devil is all about. That devil Allah is nothing but a self-motivated devil from fallen angel that just is ruling over a mass of people in this world. Amen. And he's doing Amen. it with an iron fist and he's doing it with no love, no regard for any of those who, yes, a lot of them are very uh, sincere in their approach to it. The ones that aren't, you know, 
um, full-on fundamental about their faith. You know, you can get along with, you can reason with them. They're seemingly nice people, a lot of them, right? And you, but, but the reality is, is that, is that they're deceived by this devil that has no regard for them. And let, yeah, look at our God. He's before the gods in that, in that he is high, and yet he hath respect unto the lowly. The one who is humble, the one that is sincere, the one that is low and just seeking God in it with a humble spirit, with a humble mind, seeking the living and true God. That's who God has respect for. God doesn't have respect of persons. He doesn't think that somebody that is rich is somehow better than somebody that is poor. He doesn't think that somebody who grew up in this neighborhood is somehow better than someone that grew up in this neighborhood. He doesn't think a man's better than a woman or a woman better than a man, though he gives proper orders to how structure of life should go forward. God's not a respect of persons, but he will respect the one that's lowly. He will respect the one that has set themselves up in a low, a meek, a poor, a humble state, purposefully, in order that they might get a hold of God. He has no respect for those that set themselves up as if they were gods. He has no respect for the proud, but he knoweth them afar off. So that he knows about them, he knows of them, and yet they're afar off. There's, there's no regard for them. There's no uh, caring of them. There's no care for them. They are known, but they are known afar off. God's put distance between he and them. The Bible says, your sins have separated between me and thee. That's, that's, that's what happens to the one that is proud. He is pushed back from the will of God. Our God is high. Our God is before the gods. Our God is greater than any God, lowercase g, in this world. Because, though he is high, he has respect for those that are low and those that are humble. Thou wilt revive. Look at verse 7. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, thou wilt revive me. Thou wilt stretch forth thy hand against the wrath of mine enemies, and thy right hand shall save me. God will revive us, and it's not of dead works. The living God will revive us. He will give us strength. In this world we have tribulation, but be of good cheer, the Bible says, because he has overcome the world. And though we walk through the midst of trouble. Though we walk through trials and struggles, and we feel the wrath of our enemies upon us, we feel Satan bearing down upon us, we feel self bearing down upon us, our flesh constantly tormenting us and trying us, we are contained. We are given, um, we're given opportunity to receive salvation from God through these things. He sees us and revives us. He sees us and gives us life, even when we think that we're at our wit's end. The Lord will perfect, verse 8, The Lord will perfect that which concerneth me. Thy mercy, O Lord, endureth forever. Forsake not the works of thy hands. What we're concerned about, the things that have to do with me, the troubles that I am facing, the troubles and worries that I am dealing with, what I am facing, what I am tempted with, what I'm, what I'm wanting in, what I'm lacking in my life. Because my arm will fail, and because I understand that I am lowly, I am meek, there's nothing I can do to get myself out of this, that is when God's enduring mercy is able to take hold of us. And this is an enduring mercy that has nothing to do with the gods of this world. Remember, we already discovered, we already discussed the fact that the proud are pushed aside. And anyone that would accept and lift themselves up as if they were a king, as if they were a god on this world, is put down, is abased, is put aside. And yet, though our self tries to lift us up, though Satan tries to push us down, though everything in this world is trying to keep us from doing the will of God, if we believe truly that that will is his and it's ours simply just to follow, the life, the reviving comes from him, the perfection comes from him, and it's God that will perfect that which concerneth me. It's God which will complete the things that concerneth me. He will extend mercy. He will extend grace. He will extend love. He will extend help. He will give us a comfort in the time of storm. He will help us through each and every situation of life, each and every trial that comes at us. I love this last verse. Forsake not the works of thine own hands. As if we have to even ask God for that. The God of the Bible says, I will not leave thee nor forsake thee. Though sometimes it's nice to ask him even the same because sometimes, honestly, we do feel as if we're being forsaken. We do feel pressed without measure. We do feel as if the whole world's bearing down on us. We feel as if we're going to die. But God here says he's going to revive us. He is going to stretch forth his hand. And how's he going to do it? In opposition to our enemies. He's going to take the wrath of enemies and push it away. He is going to extend that right hand. He's going to save us. 
perfect the work of his own hands. He is going to endure with us. He is going to have mercy upon us. He is not going to leave us nor forsake us. And we can trust in that. And this is just another reason why my God is before all the gods. Lift up any God you want. Lift up any idol you want. Lift up any, um, any love, any lust, anything that you are bringing into your life to try to get yourself through the next day. And I will say, nah, my God is above all of those gods. My God is above your idols. My God is above anything that you can try to throw at me to put me down. Any hurt that you can try to put on my life or my family's life. My God is bigger than all that. These struggles, these trials that I'm facing, uh, God's bigger than all of those things. I will praise thee my whole, with my whole heart. Before the gods will I sing praise unto thee. Why? Because I have no fear for the gods. I have no regard for the gods. So I can just stand in front of these lowercase g gods and just praise my Lord, worshiping towards his holy temple, the body which inhabiteth all things, and which is everywhere, including within me. And praise his name for thy loving kindness and for his truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. And there's that truth. Again, that the entirety of all of which we have discovered today, the entirety of all of which we believe upon, trust upon, have faith in, the only reason why we can even say that our God is anything, and especially the only reason why we can say he is great, he is the greatest, he is the king of kings, he is exalted above all, even as Nebuchadnezzar did. The only way we can say that is because we have heard and received and we behold the word of God. And I pray we'll continue in our lives to lean upon these truths and continue to grow in the God that is before all other gods, in the God that has preeminence above anyone that would set themselves up Amen. as a God. Amen.